of speciation. They then create summary statistics and look for loci with exceptional statistical characteristics and then try to figure out what it is that those genes might be doing. So, if our aim is to get the most out of these massive modern data sets and to have the greatest confidence in the inferences that we're making about things like outliers, then we need to answer several questions. One, what are the signatures of different evolutionary processes that are all interacting simultaneously at the genomic level when there may be many, many loci involved in the process of divergence? Secondly, how do these signatures change statistically across the speciation continuum? And when are sites with exceptional characteristics, things that we might call outliers, actually the targets of divergent selection actually involved in reproductive isolation versus when are they just along for the ride? And these are questions that I approach as a theoretician, but of course they ha I think they have a lot of relevance to analyzing lots of empirical data sets because we all want to know when and to what degree our outliers are indeed informative, when are things that some people call genomic islands actually informative and likely to contain the loci that are involved in divergence and reproductive isolation. And I think that very recent publications make it clear that the jury is still, is still out on these questions and there's still a lot that we need to learn. And we see, I've seen a lot of great talks at this conference that have already certainly uh, presented some really great approaches toward, these, uh, toward answering these questions. The approach that my collaborators and I have taken is to build and analyze individual-based simulation models. These are models where you've got discrete individuals, each individual has its own genome, and in the whole population at any given time there may be a large number of SNPs that are segregating. By simulating evolutionary time scales and keeping track of the detailed evolutionary histories, which of course you can do when, you're, when you have a model, we are able to then make inferences about the roles that all evolutionary processes play as they simultaneously act on genomes. So the model that we use is a model of two DEMs exchanging migrants at, at a given rate. And this is a model in which at the beginning there's absolutely no divergence whatsoever. So this is a model of de novo divergence with gene flow. So we've got neutral mutations and divergently selected mutations arising as time goes on. Most of them are lost immediately due to the combined actions of recombination, migration, and drift. There's a lot of that going on in the model. However, over time, you may see the buildup of a number of divergently uh, selected mutations. And if enough of them build up, oops, I went the wrong way. If enough of them build up, we may eventually have separate species form where even though there is migration between the DEMs, there's basically zero effective gene flow because of very strong multi-locus barriers to gene flow. This isn't because of incompatibilities and the results I'm going to show you, it's simply due to local adaptation, very strong local adaptation in the results I'm going to show you. So uh, this is, uh, so there are a number of, of parameters in the model. Uh, the ones that you'll see labeled in some of the results I'm going to show you mainly are the proportion of each deem migrating each generation. This is also the same as the per individual probability of migration per generation. The average per locus strength of divergent selection. This does not apply to neutral loci, of course. Uh, the total population size of, of both deems together and the population mutation rate per generation. So this is what speciation with constant high levels of gene flow is often predicted to look like one way to represent that. We've got fitness here on the x-axis, time going forward as you move up the y-axis. And because, again, this is a model of uh, de novo divergence, we start out here at the beginning, there's basically no divergence. And as we move forward through time, we accumulate gradually divergently selected mutations as well as a lot of neutral variation. Now, as this is building up, there's a lot of standing variation. During this initial phase, there's very little divergence because in the, what I'm showing you here, each mutation on its own that is divergently selected is actually subject to pretty weak divergent selection. And so the loci here uh, basically follow individually what you might expect from single locus population genetic theory until we get to a critical point in evolution at which point the dynamics of many loci become coupled to one another and we, go, and we transition from what might be called a genic phase of speciation into a genomic phase of speciation characterized by a rapid shift in the uh, divergence metrics that are associated with both individual genes and the populations as a whole. We see the rapid emergence of very strong local adaptation, which you see here in the bifurcation of these fitness values. Now, just for the purposes of convenience only, uh, I refer to this transition that happens here quite quickly as genome-wide congealing. To give you a sense for what these dynamics look like over time is as you build up from zero divergence to what we would regard as distinct species, 
I'm going to show you a, an animation that displays results from just one simulation run. So right in the middle here, we're going to see time series of important metrics plotted over time. So up here, this is effective migration rate. Down here, this is DXY, that is the average number of pairwise differences. This will be computed over all polymorphic sites in the genome. And then the two columns on the left and the right, what I'm going to show you are snapshots, histograms of uh, divergence metrics computed for individual loci, how those change over time, allele frequency differences, and down here, linkage disequilibrium of a focal locus with its nearest divergently selected neighbor. Uh, now, over here on the left, what I'm showing you are those statistics for neutral sites, in blue, and over here on your right, those same statistics, but for sites under divergence selection in red. There's a lot going on here, I recognize that, so what I suggest you do is just, you know, pick your favorite metric and watch how it changes from the beginning up until we go through this transition. So I, that's why I provide all these metrics here. I don't have a favorite, but I know some people do, so, you know, I, I, I'm not partial to, to one or another. They're all pretty interesting. They provide slightly different information. So we start out, there's basically no divergence happening whatsoever, but it's building up, divergently selected mutations are building up, and then we go through that genome-wide congealing transition. So I'm going to pause it right there, and I just want to point out the differences, massive differences between what's going on with our selected sites in the genome and the neutral sites in the genome, which again are sandwiched right in between the selected sites, right? So over here, looking at the selected sites, you know, if you just think about raw allele frequency differences or linkage to equilibrium, they couldn't be more divergent. Yet looking over here at the neutral sites, they are still relatively undiverged. That's reflected as well here. If you look at DXY, the difference between the red line and the blue line. Now, as we continue and we go forward, finally, as the effective migration rate drops more and more and more, we eventually start to see how the neutral sites begin to take off in their divergence. Now, there's a lot of really interesting things to me here that I'm, that I'm following up on studying, but the one I want to focus on for the remainder of my talk is this big gap between the selected and the neutral sites that you see here. So here's the genome-wide congealing transition right here, both before and after that, you see there is quite a big divergence gap between selected and neutral sites. And the reason that's interesting is because when this gap exists, that means that the things that we call outliers, the things that are really strongly diverged, should provide generally good signals of the loci that are indeed involved in the divergence of populations. Whereas if they weren't converged, we have uh, a much greater proportion of getting false positives. So in that regard, that I want to understand the conditions under which we see these big gaps and how long they last during the process of speciation with gene flow. I'm going to tell you right up front that of a lot of the parameters that we've looked at so far, and this is ongoing, but of a lot of the parameters we've looked at so far, population size has a huge influence on both the magnitude and the duration of these divergence gaps. You might say, well, we're only going to get a big gap in divergence when there's a lot of gene flow. So I'm going to show you uh, results from two different parameter scenarios. One where there's a very low potential for gene flow that is a very low migration rate between the genes, less than one individual per generation. And one where there's very high potential for gene flow. Just to orient you to the results you're going to see, I'm going to show you a three by three grid of results, and as you move down the rows of results, what we're looking at is increasing population size. So the top row will be populations of just 400 total, middle row 1,000, bottom row 10,000 individuals. And again, looking across the columns, you know, pick your favorite metric or, or compare and contrast all three if you wish, allele frequency differences between deems, DXY, and linkage disequilibrium of a given locus uh, with its nearest divergently selected neighbor. So, uh, here are the results for the low gene flow case. And again, there's a lot of panels here, but the message is pretty simple, regardless of what metric you choose to look at. Looking here in the top row at the small populations, we see that right from the get-go, time zero, when there's zero divergence evolving forward in those small populations, neutral sites are basically along for the ride the entire time, both qualitatively and quantitatively. But as we increase population size and move down here, we see that over a time course of more than 100,000 generations with, with these parameters, we see these very large differences in, the, in our divergence metrics that persist for a very long time between what selected sites are doing and what neutral sites are doing. And again, the, the potential for gene flow here is really small. Each individual only migrates each generation with a probability of 1 in 100,000. 
So even if our even in our largest populations, we're only getting on average one migrant every 10 generations. And still that combined with recombination is enough to keep these things having separate, um, having separate measures. If we move to the, to the parameter case with high gene flow, of course the dynamics of divergence are going to be different because of all the gene flow that happens early on. We have to wait for a large buildup of divergently selected loci before we hit that genome-wide congealing transition. But qualitatively, we see a lot of what we saw in the previous slide. That is, we've got these gaps between selected and neutral loci. The gaps are much larger, much more prominent, and prominent for much longer periods of evolutionary time in our uh, larger populations than they are in our smaller populations. And again, you know, pick, pick your favorite metric. They all, they're all telling somewhat similar stories here. There's some interesting nuances that don't have the time to get into. So I know from chatting with people at this conference that uh, for some of you, these results are going to be really intuitive, and for others, they're going to be uh, unexpected. Uh, for example, yesterday when I was at the local adaptation symposium, Sam Yeaman posed the question, well, should we be paying more attention to effective population size in the demographic uh, models that we are using when we make predictions about what things should be doing in the genome? And I'd say, yes, absolutely, we should. That's certainly one of the take-home messages here. But the general take-homes, um, very low amounts of effective gene flow are enough to keep neutral loci homogenized for long periods of time of divergence, at least in large populations. Rare migration plus recombination events, even when they're very rare, they still happen and they, and they will matter for the statistics of what we see in our uh, large data sets. With continuous gene flow during speciation, Neutral divergence may lag behind selected divergence for a very long time, both before and after the genome-wide congealing of selected sites. And finally, heterogeneity and divergence between neutral and selected sites should be larger and should last longer in populations with larger effective sizes. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Could you flush out some of the genetic assumptions? So is there any epistasis underlying in that or gene regulation that might constrain this aware of it? Right, so we did, so not in these results. We've got the capability to, to put epistasis in, to put inversions in, but in these results, uh, we've got none of that. We just have basically the, the simple accumulation of mutations at random locations in the genome. These results, uh, the genome was just four chromosomes, each only 25 centimorgans long, so the recombination rates are still actually pretty low. Some of the assumptions, at least. Yes. Um, and strength of selection, do you have any nuance on that? How I mean, it's really weak, it's really strong, how does that affect it? So, in the results I showed you, the strength of selection, uh, the average per local strength of selection was a selection coefficient of 0.02. Okay, so, and we draw those selection coefficients from an exponential distribution. So, most of them are going to be tiny. Some of them will, will be somewhat large, so, um, but yeah, most of them are pretty tiny. And then my other question is that selection was always specific to the two environments. Yes. Right? So what happens if you were to add selection that was applicable to both in addition to the ones that were used? Right, so if we add things that are universally optimal yes. or universally deleterious, yeah. um, that's a great question, and it's all I can say is it's coming in the future. <laughs>